Yeah, there we go. It pops up on y'all's screen too. Okay, I see. <laughs> uh, it's good to see everybody. This is Jeremiah part one, <clears throat> lesson number three. Uh, great, great, great lesson. So if you didn't get a chance to do uh, any or all the homework, make sure you go back and review it real quick because uh, some uh, tremendous, tremendous truths right here. Uh, let's pray together and we'll jump right into it, okay? Uh, Father, I thank you uh, for bringing us together for such a time as this. And I thank you for the word uh, that you spoke to your people back then and the word that you continue to speak to us today. Uh, I thank you for what you have spoke to us um, this week and what you want to speak to us right now. And Lord, I pray that we will have ears to hear. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, how did everybody's study go this week? Good, good, good. Got a good, got a not great. <laughs> I know sometimes I sort of struggle <clears throat> with uh, actually carrying uh, courses through the summer because I know some the summer <clears throat> the summer can be a challenging time. But I also know that a little bit's better than nothing, right? And so we just <clears throat> keep pressing on and keep pressing in. Uh, just give me a real quick review of what we've learned so far of the first couple of weeks. Uh, <clears throat> tell me, what, what is Jeremiah chapter 1 about? <laughs> yeah, I know, it's challenging. What's the other class you're doing, Kimberly? Yeah, it's got a lot of numbers in it. So uh, Jeremiah one. Yeah, that's basically it. Uh, Jeremiah. Uh, finds out he's going to be speaking the word of the Lord, and the Lord teaches him and trains him how he's going to speak to him, how he sees things, how he understands things. And uh, <clears throat> what was the word that he's going to be bringing to the people overall from what we've seen at this point in time? How would you describe it? What kind of word? Uh, yeah, yeah, a word of judgment. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, it wasn't necessarily an uplifting thing, but it was if you would receive it. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, what is it about? What did y'all entitle it, or what theme did you give it? Uh, yeah, yeah, Jeremiah, it's really the first message that he gives, and we'll see that there's obviously several messages <clears throat> that, is, that are given, and there's debate as to when one begins, another ends, uh, you know, where it is, that type of stuff. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, we'll sort of just point it out from here to there. And it is the message of the Lord through Jeremiah, and basically, uh, he, God was saying, you're going to be judged, and you're not going to prosper, because why? What had they done as a people? Yeah, instead of uh, living within the freedom and the liberty the Lord had given, instead of following him, instead of doing what he wants, they wanted to go back to Egypt. Exactly. They wanted to go back to the idols, and they'd give themselves over the idols. And uh, they c committed two great evils. Remember that? They forsook God, and they turned to idols and the nations. Uh, forsook the one who's a living of, uh, yeah, forsaken God and hewed broken cisterns. That's the great line. It really is. Uh, ch uh, chapter 3, what's it about? Yeah, he starts talking about <clears throat> the faithless ones. Uh, the first five verses are probably the end of the previous message in chapter 2. Uh, again, there's debate over that. We're not going to get into that because, you know, no reason in a limited time. <clears throat> but probably verse 6 begins another message. 
And it's about how uh, Israel uh, had been faithless, how uh, Judah and Israel both had committed harlotry exactly. And the Lord was calling them to return. That's exactly what it is. Very good. Chapter 4, what's it about? Turn or burn. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a turn. It's a continuation of the same message. And he tells them, yeah, your judgment's coming. And he actually tells them where the judgment's coming from. Did you notice that? Did he? Yeah, from the north, exactly. And you see that built upon in this week's lesson over in uh, <clears throat> chapter 6, I believe, where the Lord fleshes that out even more and gives more detail about it. And then he tells me exactly to do that, to uh, circumcise your heart and wash your evil heart. They would have been well aware of circumcision and the law and and what uh, that uh, meant and what that was a symbol of and what it was a picture of. And he says, you need to circumcise your heart. You need to return to me. So uh, chapters 5 and chapter 6 just continue uh, this same message. And so tell me, how does chapter 5 begin All right, you can tell me what is the theme of chapter 5. So, Serena says, Jeremiah cries out because it seems there's no hope no matter where they turn back to the Lord or not. Uh, it does look like that, doesn't it? <clears throat> and as we get further along in the, in the book, <clears throat> that's the reason that uh, a lot of people think these first uh, six chapters his uh, prophesying time during Josiah because there is uh, at least a modicum of hope in each one of these things. The further along you get in the book and the later on it gets, it seems uh, uh, that there is going to be no turn in the way of the judgment. Let me put it that way. Okay, that type of thing. Yeah, there's going to be a destruction. But isn't that great? At the end of the chapter, he says it's not going to be a complete destruction. And again, what's going to cause this destruction? It's because they refuse to repent. Uh, yeah, it's very beginning, Kimmy. That's exactly what happens. Uh, so who is speaking to whom in these first couple of verses where it says roam to and fro? Is it God to Jeremiah, as Kimmy says? The Lord instructing Jeremiah. Yeah, probably. Uh, though there's portions through here. Uh, I think it probably is God to Jeremiah telling him to do that. Some of the, uh, without getting into the minutia of it, uh, some of the verbs through here are in a plural form. So some people uh, think that God may actually be speaking this to Jeremiah and telling him to do it. But that as Jeremiah is going through, looking that he's proclaiming to the people also to be looking for somebody like this. Is there anybody here that is like this? So he tells them to look for someone faithful who's true. So how'd that look go? What did God say? What's he looking for, by the way? Yeah, someone faithful, as Kimmy said, and in the truth. Yeah, those who seek the truth, those who are uh, who do just. And God said what? If you can find a man... Amen. He would do what? Yeah, he would partner. And that's probably the big picture what this chapter is about. Uh, God has said, okay, you refuse to repent. And, you know, verse 9, I think he says that. But then at the end of the chapter, over 29 or somewhere, he says, uh, if you don't do that, shall I not avenge myself? Okay, yeah, so what's the story there, Sabrina, of the Genesis with Sodom and Gomorrah? We actually looked that up at the cross-reference in Genesis uh is that 18? Uh, God gave Abraham the same deal. If you can find a number of faithful men, I won't s destroy the city. So where did God start? It was 20, wasn't it? No, he started with 50. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and Abraham did what? 
He kept negotiating. Well, hmm. how about 40, Lord? How about... 40? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and don't you love the way he did it? Well, Lord, surely... If, if, if there wasn't 30, you wouldn't destroy him for just 29, would you? And he gets him down to 20, 20, then he goes where? I think he went to 10, didn't he, or 5? Got him down to 10. Yeah, got him down to 10, absolutely. Got him down to 10. Uh, but what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? There were not 10 men, period. Should, should, well, did it say men, or could it be righteous women, too? Well, yeah, but there weren't any. Should there have been? Well, yeah, because Lot was down there. Lot was sitting in the city gates. He was a leader of the city. There should have been more yeah. than just him. Why? Well, why? Because he should have been teaching, should have been instructing. Well, you were just saying, work with me here. Uh, <laughs> you were just saying he was sitting at the city gates, so that means he's a what? He's an elder of the city. He's an elder. Yeah, he's a leader of that city. And if nothing else from what you've seen with God's judgment, let's say with the Noah and the flood, you would think that who would be righteous and with what? you think at least his family would be with what? And, or, yeah, were there ten righteous in the family? I'm, I'm always sort of intrigued by that. Um because when you start adding it up, you think, I wonder if there's 10. Well, no, there wasn't. But you see that there was Lot and his wife, right? And he had the two virgin daughters, right? And then he had a son-in-law. And he had daughters, yeah, that were betrothed. Potential, oh, at least I think there's at least eight. And then it mentions that he had a, a son. Not sons, but a son. The highest number I ever get when I count is like eight, I think. Eight or nine. Eight. So God is actually saying, if you just find one or two people outside of Lot's family that are righteous, and even his family wasn't righteous. I mean, it's really sort of a sad thing. Uh, Noah worked all those years, built the, the ark, did everything. Oh, yeah, his family was a lot suspect because his wife turns around and turns into a cow lick, you know. Uh, so anyway, it's, 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 yeah, the daughter stayed behind. Two daughters. Uh, Pulled off a little shenanigan that we're still paying for right now. Y'all remember what that's about, right? They thought the world was ended, was ended and there's no more men, so let's get Daddy drunk and lay with him. There you go. They have kids named Moab and Ammon, which is uh, what we call Moab and Ammon today. Yeah, it's Jordan, exactly. And then God's got a very special place for Moab and Ammon and, and uh, Edom in the last days. So anyway, the God's just saying, I'm looking for a righteous person. Okay, I'm just looking for one that speaks the truth. Now, y'all uh, did a little side work on finding out what truth means. What did y'all find from that? And boy, if you don't know, if you didn't read it, go over and uh, read that thing that Jan posted on our uh, Facebook page. That was very good, Jan. Very useful. If Jan is still here, I don't see her. Oh, there she is. Okay. So what did you learn about truth? Jan, tell us in fewer words than you did on the Facebook post. <laughs> well, there you go. He got his truth. Yeah, you got all those, those little uh, interesting things, you know. Yeah, firmness, steadfastness, steadiness. In what? That's always the issue when people come up like, well, in what? You say this is true, I say this is true. What is it in, you know? And over in Jeremiah uh, chapter 3 and chapter 4, the Lord was calling his people faithless, but he recalled them, he called them to return to being faithful. Yeah, in God, that's it. In faith, he looks for the faithful, the ones that will be firm, that will be steadfast, that will be steady, and that will, okay, will exhibit actions based upon 
who God is and what he has commanded and instructed us to do. That is truth. I think you can know truth and not live it out. I mean, I think uh, Lucifer might be a good example of that. But yeah, that was a good study, uh, a good thing to, to remind ourselves of what this is speaking, speaking about right here. So uh, God tells Jeremiah, I want you to go, it's just the first couple of verses here, we'll, we'll move quicker now. But he tells him, go see if you can find somebody like this, okay? What was his reaction to that? What was his response? We see it there in verse 3 and 4. Look in verse 3. It says, O oh Lord, do not, not thou look for truth. So this is Jeremiah responding, apparently. Thou hast smitten them, but they had what? He's acknowledging that God had already done some things here. He had smitten them, but they had not weakened. Yeah, they didn't back off. Thou hast consumed them, but they refused to do what? To take correction. Exactly. They made their faces harder than to repent. Uh, remember last week we saw that in a couple places. Uh, does that sound familiar to anybody? Oh yeah, okay, you see it in Judges. I don't know about y'all, but I see it every day. Okay, I see it day out. Day in, day out. Jan, okay, you must be watching a convention there over on the side. Yeah, you see it everywhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, sad to say, sometimes I see it in a mirror. But we will not talk about that. Okay? Okay, we all have a tendency sometimes to want to do exactly something like that. So, uh, yeah, 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 I don't want to step on the toes. So Jeremiah determines at the beginning of verse 4, he's going to do what? He says, oh, well, it must be just who that's like this. It must be the poor, okay? Why would it be the poor? Yeah, they don't know you. They don't know God. They don't know the ordinance. They don't know the, the commandments, the instructions. Well, what, why is he basing that? Oh, that's a rather uh, 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 castish thing. Because they don't have education, he's assuming they're poor and they're uneducated and they don't know. Well, perhaps. How'd that go? He says, well, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll go to who? He went to the educated, which he describes as what? Oh, gosh, isn't this great? <laughs> the great. Those who know the law. Why are they worse? Oh, sh sorry, I didn't mean to yell. Why are they worse? <laughs> they should know better because they're educated. I'm sorry. I don't know how educated we all are, all are here. Uh, I don't even like that phrase anymore uh, just because of what it connotes. I've got four separate college degrees, and some of the most ignorant, foolish, uh, can I say lovingly dumb people I know are people with PhDs okay, that are highly, highly, highly educated. Uh, some of the smartest people I know are those that don't have the education of man from an academic perspective, but they know the word, they have working skills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, yeah, I know what you mean uh, when, when we're saying educate, but we have a tendency, and that's what we're seeing right here. He said, oh, uh, the great will know because they have had the opportunity. Uh, Kimmy says they should know better. Sabrina says they don't do what they were supposed to do, and that's what the issue was. They knew, but they didn't do it. Okay, They knew, but they didn't do it. And, uh, yeah, well, what is that about, Jan? Wasn't that a great line? Because it said, what was it, they broke the yoke of the Lord's bonds of ordinance? <laughs> they, they simply thought they knew better. So because of that, the Lord says what? Therefore, it's one of many therefores that we encounter. What's he going to do?
yeah, he's going to destroy him. And he starts talking about how he's going to do it. Yeah, what is that deal about a lion? Yes, they had three animals right here. Yeah. yeah, a lion, a wolf, and a leopard. Why do you think he God gave three animals? Yeah, particularly the uh, the wolf kind of thing. You have the nature of the wolf, the speed of the leopard, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, he says, "I'm going to destroy you," yeah. and it's because of the, uh, the transgressions. Uh, uh, no, I don't think it's three different peoples. Um, I think he's just driving home the point uh, that their, you know, their faithlessness was going to cost them. So God had told him, that if you'll find some faithful men or faithful man, I will pardon them. Mm -hmm. uh, were there any faithful man found? Yeah, later on it comes from the north. Yeah, that there weren't any. Now, it's sort of interesting because uh, wasn't Jeremiah faithful? Yeah, there were some people there that were faithful unto the Lord. But they were the ones that, that were functioning within the calling of the Lord. They were walking in that. And the ones that were um, outside of that were completely and totally unfaithful. So what does he say, verse 7 through 9? He asked that question, you know, why should I pardon you? Uh, probably not of age, you're right. At this point, I don't think I can pull it up. I had a, uh, where did I run across that? Well, I won't worry about it right now. There's about three or four guys that are in Scripture that we believe were alive at that time that could have... Uh, Qualified as being faithful. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit earlier, exactly. <clears throat> so God says, here's what I'm going to do. Why should I pardon you? And there's no reason for me to pardon you because I, I can't even find one person. And he says what we've already said, that they were a people and a nation of idolatry, of adultery. Uh, and the Lord says, I'm going to avenge myself. He said, I would like, and I think it's important for us to see for the balance of it. At the very beginning, the Lord says here, you know, why should I pardon you? At the very beginning, he says, if you find one, I will pardon. So the Lord's desire was to do what? Yeah, his desire was to pardon. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to do that. Uh, so, uh, Jeremiah 5. What do we learn beginning with verse 10? We see the Lord is going to avenge himself. Yeah, what do you see happening from verse 10 through verse 19? And uh, all this stuff, by the way, folks, I hope that you've seen... Uh, can I say is current is the word for the day. We see this happening now. Okay, what verse is that in, Arthur Jan? Go up through her vine rows and destroy, but do not execute a complete destruction. Strip away her branches, for they are not the Lord's. For the house of the Lord and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously with me, declares the Lord. They have lied about the Lord. <clears throat> I think he's talking about the ones that he's bringing forth to destroy. It's the ones that would go through the vines. And that's what they were saying, uh, Sabrina. Uh, uh, the people in Israel and Judah, we'll, we saw more about that later, the prophets and the priests, etc., we're all saying, no, 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 the Lord's not going to do this. The misfortune of the Lord will not come. Okay? This is not God. And at this point in time, what had, had uh, already happened to the northern kingdom?
Yeah, they'd already been taken away in captivity. So what were they saying about that? Yeah, Assyria had done that. Well, not only were they saying it won't happen to us, they were also saying, uh, well, that wasn't God's doing. Okay. They were saying, oh, that stuff that happened 100 years ago, uh, that, that, that wasn't really God. That's just, you know, some bad things that happen sometimes. <laughs> you know? But look what it says in verse uh, 12. They've lied about the Lord. And said, not he, misfortune will not come on us, and we will not see sort of flame. The prophets are as wind, and the word is not in them. Thus it will be done to them. Yeah. At best, the prophets were uh, just making up the words. Okay? Just making up things. Uh, do people do that today? Do prophets do that today? Sure. False prophets, by definition, falsely prophesy. Sometimes real prophets, sometimes a person who's truly saved, who uh, speaks forth the word, uh, speaks forth a word that is untrue. They may know it's untrue. They may not know it's untrue. But here's talking about those. Yeah, and these were the ones that were saying peace, peace. Yeah. And it says that they're just blowing hot air. Okay. That's all they're doing. So because of that, verse 14, therefore what? Yeah, he's going to consume them. How's he going to consume them? Yeah, that's sort of interesting. Um, therefore, uh, verse 14, thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you've spoken this word, behold, I am making my words in your mouth fire, and this people would, and it will consume them. Yeah, that's sort of an interesting uh, uh, picture, isn't it? He said the word that you're going to speak, and you see later on that Jeremiah says, you know, I tried to keep this uh, in me, but I couldn't. I had to just say it. I had to proclaim it. It's because it was burning from the Lord. Okay, the nation from afar, he calls it what kind of nation? Yeah, the ancient nation. Yeah. Uh, enduring ancient nation, which is Babylon. He's going, and it's going to devour everything. So an enduring nation, an ancient nation, lang a nation language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. What are they going to do? Their quivers open grave. They're going to kill you, in other words. All them mighty men. And then, did you notice there was a key word, devour, in the 17th verse? <laughs> what are they going to devour? Well, now you know. Yeah, they're going to devour the harvest. Yeah, everything. That's it. Everything. Harvest, food, sons, daughters, flocks, herds, vines, fig trees. And then they're going to demolish with the sword fortified cities. So things are pretty hopeless, right? Yeah. He says, yet, even in those days, verse 18, declares the Lord, I will not make you a complete destruction. Though the people of that time, the people experiencing that, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, would likely be completely destroyed, but there would be a remnant. I mean, a remnant, remnant. So, and he says in verse 19, when it comes back, when they say, "Why has the Lord our God done all these things?" This, then you should say to them, "What? As you've forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so you shall serve strange strangers in a land that is not yours." They'll make the curses. Okay. Uh, yeah, was it in this lesson that y'all did went back and read like two chapters out of Deuteronomy? Okay. And y'all yeah, will have to forgive me. Boy, you think it's bad on your end. I'm still halfway through Isaiah here in the local classes. And uh, that's worse than doing numbers and, uh, and Jeremiah at the same time. 
Uh, I'm doing two sessions of Isaiah right now, and I'm actually doing uh, uh, the Wednesday night services. If y'all remember, I told you the church I'm uh, doing a little part-time interim worship gig at. Uh, the pastor left here in March, and so for the summer, uh, they wanted me to do the little Wednesday night prayer meeting thing, which is sort of interesting because it's the kind of thing that nobody else on staff wants to do, and uh, and I'm sitting there thinking, y'all are crazy, and so I go walking in there, and there's 50 or 60 little old people, and I told them, I said, well, here's what we're going to do, and they've just gone crazy over it, um, and I, I told them I wasn't sure if we'd be able to do it, but it looks like we're going to. Uh, we are praying Daniel chapter 9, Ezra chapter 9, and Nehemiah chapter 9. Remember, those are three chapters that deal with prayers on behalf of a nation. And we're going to pray these three chapters uh, at least until November of the election. And so I'm just you know, reading a couple of verses and sharing a couple of things out of the verses. And then we're actually praying. I think it's taken us four weeks now to get through the first seven chapters, I mean, first seven verses of uh, Daniel 9. Because in, in that kind of gathering, you know, we talk so much about praying, but we rarely do it together, if truth be said. Much less where it's just open and, and I'll just tell them, I said, okay, here's the truth. This is how we're to pray. Now let's do it. Somebody else lead. And I just wait. And somebody will, you know, lead. And so that's that's been a really good, uh, uh, good thing. Uh, y'all hang on a second, okay? Just a second. Okay. I just sent my, I just sent my wife a text. I had a little news thing pop on my computer right here saying they had a bad wreck up here on the road and one car is on fire. So I just sent her a text. You okay? <laughs> Y'all ever do that with your family when you see these things pop up? <clears throat> yeah, so anyway, um, where were we? How did I get distracted on that? Uh, oh, yeah, I know what it was because sometimes I'm sitting there thinking, uh, is it in Jeremiah, the Isaiah list, where, where the Deuteronomy thing? So y'all read those two chapters, uh, chapter 28, wasn't it? 29 out of Deuteronomy? Uh, yeah, Daniel 9, Ezra 9, Nehemiah 9. They're all three uh, prayers that are being lifted up on behalf of a nation. And uh, we just need to pray the way they did. Yeah, and what you saw, God told them in Deuteronomy, he says, it's real simple. If you do what I tell you to do, you will be blessed. Okay. If you don't, you're going to be cursed. And he was very detailed about the curses. I mean, it's uh, uh, not good. And so they were actually beginning to suffer that. Yeah, Kimmy. Mm -hmm. That's it, Nehemiah 9. So he tells them in a rather little poetic type of way there at the end of chapter, uh, verse 9. As you forsaken me and serve foreign gods in your land, you shall serve strangers in a land that's not yours. He's telling them you're going to be taken off somewhere else. <clears throat> okay, my wife's okay. Good. Glad to hear that. So, what does uh, verse 20 say? Through the balance of the chapter, I think. Yeah. Yeah, he says you don't fear God. And he calls him what? Yeah, isn't that a great line? You're foolish. You're senseless. You have a, a, a rebellious heart. You're stubborn. Your eyes don't see. Your ears don't hear. You turned aside. You departed. What had the wicked done? They didn't fear him to start with. None of them did. He said the wicked became great and rich. And I love the little line. They excelled in wickedness. Okay. They excelled in wickedness. 
<clears throat> so God says, I'm going to punish the nation. And, and then this phrase, uh, he says he, he'll avenge himself. Did you think about that some? What does that mean? That he'll avenge himself. I don't particularly have an answer. I was just asking, but I hear this uh, abundant silence here. What does avenge mean? Yeah, and the Lord says vengeance is mine, right? He's a judge. But avenging carries the context uh, of why. Yeah, something that is done against somebody. Has a right to avenge himself. Avenge himself before whom or what? Okay, before the people, to show that his words are true, right. Anyone else? I think that's absolutely correct. Okay, but yeah, what witnesses? Well, that covers everything, doesn't Sabrina? Everyone? Uh, do I want to be tedious and say who is everyone? I th there you go, Sharice. It's before his own people, yes. To show them that he was right. It's before the nations because of the shame that was brought before God because of the way the people were acting in, in front of and behalf of the nations. What else? Okay, that's a good way to, that's a succinct synopsis there, Sabrina. Those who hold to him and those who do not hold to him. How about those that hold to him and those that do not hold to him within the heavenly realms? So I think it does go back to that everyone, everything kind of thing you're talking about, Sabrina, uh, dealing with creation. And, you know, I think that when you start seeing those little things like that, it helps us understand what's uh, said uh, over in Romans, that, you know, how the heavens declare that, I mean, uh, uh, creation is moaning and groaning the waiting the day of the sons of God, their redemption. Creation is impacted. You know, you see it in Genesis 3, because of the rebellion of Adam and Eve, creation was impacted. Yeah, the angels with God longingly look into salvation. Those that have left him are sitting there tempting and doing all the evil, going na 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 that type of thing. So there's something about that avenging himself that's really important. Okay, the last couple of verses of this fifth chapter, isn't it great? What do those last couple of verses say? Yeah, they're watching, they're waiting. And when we walk the way that they are walking, the stubborn heart, rebellious heart, how long can God not avenge? Avenge yourself as a testimony to creation. Uh, very much so, Jan, yeah. So what are verse, uh, verses 30 and 31 talking about? There's an appalling thing. There's a horrible thing. What is it? Mm. The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests rule on their own authority, and the people love it so. To which I say, which is the reason I put a little thing on our little Facebook group here a few days ago. I was just studying that passage and looking at it and just thinking, man, nothing's changed. Why is the last part the worst? The 
the great line is, and what will you do at the end of it? The end of what? What is the it? Okay, yeah, don't you see echoes or precos, whatever you want to call them, of uh, things in the New Testament? Uh, Romans 1. Lack about caring about justice, righteousness. The priests rule on their own authority. How should the priests have been ruling? The phrase itself gives a hint to the answer. Yeah, on the authority of the Lord. Absolutely. If the prophets were uh, uh, prophesying falsely, how should they have been prophesying? Truthfully. The word of the Lord. Yeah. Uh, I tell you what. Nothing's changed. Let's see what Sabrina says here. We have people who do the wrong thing all the time. And then we bring them justice for their actions. But here, the people love the injustice. It will not bring to account. Yeah, I'm experiencing it in so many different ways, folks. Uh, with people just really not wanting you know, to know what the truth is. And if you sit there and say, oh, well, the reason we're facing these issues is because we're not doing what the Word tells us. And they're very nice and very kind and will listen and then go right out and do what they want to do. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you have that at the uh, in the political level. Okay? You definitely have that. But, you know, I don't expect anything better from the world. I do expect something better from those that profess to be the children of the Lord. And that was the issue right here. Okay. That was the issue here. So, uh, continue on. Uh, chapter 6. Uh, hello, Methodist Church. Let me tell you, it's just as bad in the Baptist Church. Uh, I, I can give you a little history lesson sometime. You can just go back through the generations and see how the nominations have, once they turn away from the Word of God within a generation or two, they get into just abject uh, humanistic foolishness. Nowadays, it just happens a lot quicker, uh, a lot quicker. Uh, what well, I'm in a in a Baptist church right now, and the problem there is they talk the talk real good, but what they actually do is not walking out to walk. No, it doesn't matter what denomination it is. If you're not just doing the simplicity of it, and actually, uh, I don't remember which passage it, we might have skipped it here a while ago, or maybe coming up in the sixth verse. I think it's in the sixth chapter, yeah, where he talks about, hey, why don't you go back to the ancient paths? You know, we really need to seek the ancient paths and the ancient way. Uh, I think that's a real, yeah, thing for us. Why well, ain't that sweet? Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, we celebrate uh, evil, we celebrate. Oh, you yellow highlighted the 16th. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, moving into chapter 6 here quickly. Um, what's this uh, chapter about? What did y'all entitle it? What is this theme? Yeah, what was the warning? You basically already touched upon it in the, in the previous chapter. Before he'd been talking to Israel and Judah. Now, he's focusing in on Jerusalem and Judah. Yeah, he's saying this. Uh, you didn't listen to me. You rejected God's law. I'm going to reject you. Yeah, and he starts off with the first uh, uh, verse. Is that the first verse? Yeah, he says, O sons of Benjamin. Why uh, is Jeremiah talking to the sons of Benjamin? And, and they're right next door there to Jerusalem. Benjamin was the second tribe. So there was Judah and Benjamin. Those right. Are the only two tribes of the southern kingdom. So yeah, and and Jeremiah is actually of that tribe, I think, isn't he? Was he? I think so. Uh, hang on a second. Do, 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 do. I'm flipping a couple of, pages back here. Son of Hilkiah. Yep, land of Benjamin. Land of Benjamin. I was about to say it's in the first verse, isn't it? That's what I was flipping back to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that helps clarify things a bit, doesn't it? So some people say that he was calling for his people uh, to leave first, which he very well may have been. Because you know how it is, folks. A lot of times people won't listen, they won't listen. But when they see somebody taking the lead of following the word of the Lord, they'll follow. Okay, they'll follow. 
And so uh, so he tells them what to do. What does he tell them to do in that first verse? Well, he says, flee. And to do what? Yeah, blow a trumpet and raise a signal. And what, what's the point of that? And that's it, Jan. Yeah, uh, not just sneak out and say, y'all are on your own. But he's saying, hey, you know, blow the trumpet, raise up the signal. In other words, burn a fire on the mountain over there. In case they couldn't hear the trumpet, they'll see the light and see the smoke. That you need to flee, something's coming on. And the idea being that judgment is coming. Okay, judgment's coming. Y'all actually looked and did a little cross-referencing out of Ezekiel related to the watchman. Okay, and we'll study that a lot more when we get to Ezekiel. But the idea being that if you know what the truth is, and you haven't spoken forth that truth and haven't warned people, what's happened to you? What have you done? Yeah, blood's on your head. Thank you. That's exactly it. But if you come along and you speak forth the uh, word and they ignore you and they get captured, etc., then you are what? You're innocent because you've spoken the truth. And that the picture is we need to speak forth the truth. Okay? We need to let them know. And that's what he was saying. Arise. And he says, what's going to happen? The enemy's going to come. Uh, tell me how it's going to happen. He's already said he's bringing this nation from afar. Uh, ancient nation whose language they didn't understand. I wonder why God made such a big deal over the fact that it's a language they didn't understand. Any ideas? Yeah, evil looking down from the fort, north. I had an idea come to mind right when I asked the question. <laughs> Yeah, uh, language is fundamental. And then also it makes a deal this uh, a far distant thing that is coming from the north. We've talked before why it's coming from the north because there's desert to the east. The uh, actual country is further off to the east, Babylon, or whether it's Assyria or Babylon, whatever. So they'd have to go around that little fertile crescent thing coming down from the north. You can't live well in a land where you don't know their language. They would learn the language. But, you know, it's saying this. I'm not using the country that's there next to you to judge you. I'm not using somebody that is loosely related to you to judge you. Because all those countries around there can claim Abraham as father. Right? Yeah, and this is, I mean, this is way, way back. Because Abraham actually came from this land. <laughs> okay? The one that's going to be using to judge him. So he's going to bring forth these curses. He's going to bring forth the siege. Y'all uh, checked out some things related to that also over in Deuteronomy. What's going to happen when it's all said and done? Yeah, he's going to bring them back. <clears throat> but first he says this. You're going to be punished. You're going to be punished your own land. I'm going to scatter you all over the place. Your your land is not going to be yours anymore. You're not going to find any rest. He's going to stretch his hands out. And three times in this chapter, in verses uh, 22, 16, and 9, the phrase said, Thus says the Lord. He's letting them know that this is me speaking. So in verse 9, what does he say about thus says the Lord? And it's a Lord of hosts. Remember, uh, cut down the trees, raise up the city, the, uh, the siege against Jerusalem. The city is going to be punished. In whose midst there is only what? Yeah, according to verse 9, he says, in whose midst, I mean, not verse 9, uh, verse 6, there's only oppression. There's only oppression. And, and to me, that's just one of the saddest things when there's an, an oppressive uh, spirit in the midst. And so in verse 7, what did you learn about Jerusalem? What was she doing? It's an interesting turn of the phrase. 
we'd heard already that she was wicked. Keeps fresh her wickedness. Yes, what does that mean, Sabrina? What do you think that's about? I think that's the idea. And it's new every morning. Great is their wickedness, right? Uh, that they weren't just resting on the wickedness of the past. That not only were they unrepentant and refusing to, to turn to the Lord, they were doing it every day. Yeah. Uh, how does it describe? Violence, destruction, sickness, and wounds. Ever. And he tells verse 8, Be warned, O Jerusalem, lest I alienate from you. Be, alien be alienated from you. Lest I make you a desolation, a land not inhabited. That is what's going to happen. Yeah, they were just functioning new wickedness every day. Verse 9, he says again, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. He says they're going to be what? <laughs> Great little phrase. Thoroughly gleaned. What does that mean? Yeah, that's that's it, Sabrina. Yeah, Janice, what that means. It's picking the leftover. So he's saying that the destruction that's coming through them in this vineyard, that they're going to pick every grape off the vine. Okay? So Jeremiah had a question in a lot of that. What did he say in, in verse 10? He said, who am I supposed to give this word of warning to? Because, you know, their ears are closed, their eyes are shut. Yes, yeah, so, and what was God's answer? He'd already told him, yeah, no one's going to hear. Remember how Isaiah had received that same word? Jeremiah said, I'm so weary of holding it in. This is what I was referring to earlier. Okay, where's that, verse 11? I'm still full of the wrath of the Lord. I'm weary of holding it in. Poured up on the children of the street, on the gathering young men, from the husbands with have taken, the age of the very old. He's saying, you know, you release that word upon everybody. From the greatest to the least, the liars. Yes, the same message. The Lord was trying to get his people to turn and repent, that whether they were greedy. And he talks about the greediness. Look at verse uh, 13. For from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for gain. And from the prophets, even to the priest, everyone deals how? Falsely. Their leadership, their spiritual religious leadership was dealing falsely. How? They've healed the brokenness of my people superficially. You know, we hear that phrase all the time, peace, peace, but there is no peace. And it actually appears a couple times in Scripture. But I don't know if I ever really knew the context of this right here, that first part of it, that they've healed the brokenness of my people superficially. If, you're, if your brokenness has been healed superficially, what does that mean? Yeah, it's sort of over on the outside. It's like you've been cracked and you've been broken, but they put the spackle over you and put a new coat of paint on you. Yeah, uh, there you go. A false assurance, and they're doing it with words. Okay? Saying peace, peace. And everybody's acting like there's peace, but inside they know there's peace, and they know that there's no peace. Uh, we do see it right now uh, at a political level. Okay? Yeah, isn't that the truth, Sabrina? So anyway, uh, let me read uh, 15 just to continue into 16. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they've done? They were not even ashamed at all. They, didn't, they don't even know how to blush. Therefore, no, therefore, they shall fall among those who fall at the time that I punish them. 
they shall be cast down, says the Lord. Then the third, thus says the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you shall find rest for your soul. But they said, why? We will not walk in it. We've already seen where they've done the same thing before, where they refused to walk in what the Lord had called them to do. Uh, whether it be in Isaiah, the same exact phrase was used. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's real simple. Just, just rest and walk in the ancient past, and you'll find the rest for your soul. But what was their response? No, we're not going to do it. We're not going to walk in it. They said, we're not going to do it. Oh, absolutely. And the, Yeah, the question that pops up is, what is the ancient path? What is the ancient path for us? What's the ancient path for them? What would you say to someone if they asked you that? What is the ancient path? Yeah, you might be able to say scripture, but you're actually sort of limiting yourself when you say that. I know every time I say something like that, it sounds like heretical. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's what I'd say, uh, Serena. Um, the ancient path is the ways of the Lord. The ways of the Lord. They had the ways of the Lord in the Mosaic law, Levitical law. We have it in what the Lord has done. And we have the completed scripture now but to abide in him. So he tells them quickly that he set watchmen over, tell them the thing, listen to the sound of the trumpet. You know, in other words, I'm sending warnings, but they gave him no heed whatsoever. So the people wouldn't walk in it, they wouldn't listen, so the Lord says, what's going to happen? Disaster's coming, because you're rejected. Yeah, yeah, Jan, it, it would have been the uh, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so he says, I'm bringing forth this because you've rejected my word. Uh, but they were worshiping. He says that the, they were bringing offerings and sacrifices. Wasn't God excited about that? Don't you think the Lord gets excited and we get all whipped up for him and everything? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It is, Sabrina, yeah. Yep. No, that's it, Jan. It wasn't from the heart. And God says that. It wasn't from the heart. You're worshiping other gods at the same time. So because of that, there's another therefore. And what did the Lord say there? Verse 22, therefore... And he reiterates what he's already told him, what he had told Isaiah a hundred years before. Tell him, a great nation's coming. Everyone's going to die. Yeah, they are an extremely cruel nation. There's going to be no mercy. Uh, he calls them a destroyer coming from the north. It's going to be sudden. There's going to be tremendous terror. He gives them the detail all about it. He says it's going to be great lamentation for my daughter. So he calls them to put on sackcloth and ashes and mourn. For suddenly the destroyer, yeah, the daughter of Zion is Jerusalem. Yes, the picture that you're seeing, exactly. So then the last uh, verses we looked at this week out of chapter 6, we learned some more things uh, about Jeremiah himself. Yeah, Jan, I think it did. What did we learn about Jeremiah? You could actually give him a title right here. What is the title you might be able to give him? Yeah, now they hear. Yeah, exactly. An assayer. What is an assayer? And don't say one who assays. Yeah, he's actually saying this. It's the one who tests. It's the one who has been given authority and the power to... Um, yeah, thank you, Sabrina. That's a great way to put it. The, the set boundaries. 
to know what the truth is about something. And the example he gives is related to what? He said because they're rebellious and they're stubborn. They're bronze and iron. They're all, they're corrupt. And he says the bellows blow fiercely. The lead is consumed by the fire. Bain. The refined. Finding goes. Own, but the way wicked are. Not separating. They call. All them reject Silver or reprobate. So, over. Cause a Lord has has rejected. to them. What he's saying is that 
I've given you. You the power. Power and.